Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest Queen Elizabeth Scholarship webinar. We're coming to you today from the McMaster Health Forum at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Quick agenda for today's uh, webinar. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the McMaster Health Forum, a little bit about the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, and then I'm going to turn it over to our Queen Elizabeth Scholar who will be doing her presentation today. Uh, and Abby will be talking about the work that she did in Oxford in the UK. The McMaster Health Forum is a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We aim to harness information, convene stakeholders, and prepare action-oriented leaders to be a, an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations Canada, Universities Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. The version of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship that we have for here at the McMaster Health Forum is called Sprinting Health Systems. Our, our scholars contribute to Strengthening Health Systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. We currently have had two full cohorts of individuals who have taken part in our scholarship program. This uh, on the screen now is our first cohort of individuals. And on our second cohort is on this screen, and you'll see that we had quite a few interns who went away in primarily in the summer of 2017. And most of our webinars are from these folks this fall. Our presenter today is Abby, who uh, during her, well, at the time of her internship was actually a Bachelor of Health Sciences uh, student here at McMaster University. Her experiences with marginalized populations in both advocacy and clinical settings motivated her to further investigate the interplay between policymakers and health systems researchers. Through integrating research evidence with health policy, her hope is to develop a stronger understanding of how social determinants of health play a role in different health systems. She is currently at the University of Toronto in their MD program, uh, and she's joining us today from Toronto. So, Abby, I'm going to turn it over to you, and hope everyone enjoys. Thank you for the introduction, James. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. But first, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my webinar, either online or in person. I really appreciate the support. Today I'll be discussing my internship this summer at Oxford in the United Kingdom. It was a self-arranged internship, so pretty interesting. And at the end, I'll be taking any questions. So, um, sorry, James, I think you might have to set the toggle for the presenting the slides. Great. Alright, so let's get started. Today I'll be discussing my internship, the learning goals that I had, my projects and work, the different learning opportunities that I had a chance to pursue as part of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, as well as thoughts on my overall experience and living in the United Kingdom. So my internship was three months. I landed a bit before that in April of 2017 and stayed until the beginning of August 2017, giving myself a few days to settle in and settle out. It was a self-arranged internship that went through many ups and downs. I was awarded the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship, I believe, in late summer, around August, and it took almost a year to prep and figure out where exactly I wanted to pursue my internship. I had thought out different universities, different health systems, different policy-making organizations, and finally settled with a self-arranged internship with the National Health System. It was located at the Oxford Health NHS Trust in Oxford, and I lived just outside of Oxford in Headington um, for affordability. So before I begin to discuss my internship, I thought it was necessary to talk about what an NHS trust actually is. So the health system in the United Kingdom is a bit different from Canada. In Canada, we are publicly funded but not publicly provided. In the United Kingdom, it's both publicly funded and publicly provided. So hospitals and clinics are often government-owned buildings. So an NHS trust is an organization within England's NHS that either serves a geographic area or a specialized function, such as ambulatory care or mental health care. I was interested in mental health care, and I looked at the 60 different trusts that were available within England looking specifically at mental health care. 
And Oxford Health is a foundation trust, which is a bit different from a normal NHS trust in that it's more autonomous from the government. So it has a bit more managerial and financial freedom and control of its own aims separate from the government. And in 2015, it was announced that they wanted to make a shift in the NHS so that all trusts were able to experience this semi-autonomy. However, they are still in this transition period. And at the moment, there are only a few foundation trusts within England, and I was lucky to be placed at one at Oxford Health. The picture here is of the Warningford Hospital, which is located in Oxford and is the location of the Oxford Health Trust. Something that really struck me in the United Kingdom was just how old everything was and the history that was behind everything. This hospital was over 200 years old and something that you can definitely tell from the architecture and even when working there in the offices, it really struck me how old it was and the history that was present there. And so foundation trusts, they can either be located at hospitals, at government buildings, or at a combination of the two in sort of outpatient clinics with a research focus. And the Oxford Health Trust that I was interning at had a large focus on quality improvement within the national health system, not just for the area it was servicing, so Oxfordshire, but also the greater NHS system, specifically the 60 different trusts for mental health care. So when I came into this internship, I was really fortunate that I had amazing mentors available at Oxford Health who wanted me to pursue what I was interested in, and specifically any learning goals that I thought would be useful throughout my career and throughout my undergraduate experience. So for me, this was a couple different things. I really wanted to not only understand the United Kingdom health system in depth and their unique health issues and their perceptions towards things such as Brexit and those effects on the healthcare system, but I also wanted to gain skill sets, specifically soft skill sets for learning how to lead effective meetings with researchers and clinicians, on how to create effective products and deliverables, and also how to better network with health policymakers, legal advocates, and healthcare practitioners worldwide. Something else that I noticed is while a large focus of my work was um, related to the internship, I also wanted to learn how to become more comfortable in the United Kingdom with transportation, with living arrangements, and finding a community within the United Kingdom so that I was able to explore history, culture, politics with a support system that was able to support me. And this is often difficult to do for scholars who are abroad, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity that the QES community gave me with engaging with other scholars, not only in the United Kingdom, but also in other countries through digital means. And I'll be talking a bit more about that later. So the main focus of my work at the UK was a new healthcare service known as Street Triage. Street Triage is a partnership effectively between the healthcare system and police services to provide effective on-site care for individuals who are serving a mental health crisis. So previously, if individuals in the community had a mental health crisis and were thought to be a harm to either themselves or to others, it would be the sole responsibility of the police and any police officers who were uniformed and on duty to provide this care. This would often result in detentions under Section 136 of the Criminal Code in which they were able to hold people for 72 hours. And usually what was being happening is that these people were not being held in hospitals or clinics, but they were held in police holding cells. And this was, of course, known as an excessive use of force on many occasions. It was often traumatic to people who were experiencing a mental health crisis. And above all, it wasn't collaborative with mental health services who would be better able to serve those needs. So in 2013, um, nine different NHS trusts were awarded grants for pilot projects for street triage in which you'd have a mobile team of a police officer along with a mental health clinician providing care directly on site. And Thames Valley, which includes Oxfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, um, was able to be one of those pilots and enact this pretty innovative platform in which you directly have collaborations between these different forms of um, government services. 
However, what was found is that they weren't sure exactly how effective these services actually were in reducing the number of Section 136s, in reducing the tensions, reducing physical force, and it wasn't sure if this collaboration was even feasible, just because the police system and the health system were known to be so different in terms of their operating model, hierarchy, and as well um, the goals of their actual services. So what our role was, was to effectively evaluate whether or not we thought that street triage could be useful within the national health system, and specifically Oxfordshire. And this was sort of fueled by a large degree of media attention and extensive news coverage on these street triage collaborations, just because there were a few high profile cases in which individuals complained that they were being treated as criminals effectively by a police system that wasn't able to serve their specific mental health needs. And it's something that was really understandable, just because the police system on its own is for security of the greater public and of the public at large, whereas the health system had more of a focus on the individual who would require the care. And neither was wrong. It was just that they had to have that bridge between the health system and the police and social systems in order to get this care actually off the ground. So this is something that I was really interested in just because it seemed very um, innovative and practical and to have this collaboration between different areas within the government system, health, as well as police. So from my end, there are three different goals that I had for evaluating street triage for the NHS, which was a priority area that Oxford Health had noted. It was one, an evaluation of available services in every NHS mental health trust. So because we have 60 different NHS mental health trusts and they're semi-autonomous, there isn't a lot of transparency in terms of what services are actually available at every single location. So for example, some um, MHS trusts, sorry, NHS trusts labeled street triage as having a phone operating service. Some of them labeled it as having a solely nurse-led team. Some of them thought that just training police officers in mental health training constituted a street triage. And after this pilot sort of funding in 2013, there wasn't a lot of follow-up to see what services were actually being available and what the gaps in these services was. So that was one of my roles, was to contact each of the mental health trusts and evaluate and compile data in terms of what services were being offered and the specifics of them. Something else that we did was create a questionnaire for police officers in the Thames Valley because what we found is that a huge driver in terms of the funding that was available within the NHS was police collaboration. So if police officers actually felt comfortable dealing with an individual who was in a mental health crisis and if they felt that they were adequately trained or not. So that was a questionnaire that we had devised in full collaboration with um, the police chief at Thames Valley as well as the NHS. And it was one that took a lot of work, frankly, to make sure that it was both sensitive and fully transparent and seeing what the actual gaps of knowledge regarding mental health care were. And finally, we also led a systematic review of similar street triage services worldwide as well as within the United Kingdom, um, just to inform any decision making specifically at Oxford. And this was done as a collaboration between Oxford University as well as the Oxford Health Trust that I was interning at. The systematic review was actually really interesting because street triage is usually known as a healthcare police collaboration, and so it wasn't often published in peer-reviewed reports. Uh, often within the police um, system, we have a lot of publishing within um, gray literature, within internal documents, so it was hard to find a lot of the available literature that we knew was out there. So we consulted with an information specialist in order for us to evaluate both gray literature from the police side as well as peer-reviewed literature from the healthcare side. Something else that we found was really interesting was that there was a huge worldwide focus on street triage, but there were differences between countries. I was really interested in how Canada and Ontario specifically looked at street triage, and I was surprised to learn that Toronto actually does have a mobile crisis intervention team, and I was able to compare that to the services that were available in the UK, which is a great learning opportunity for me, just being at the intersection of both countries. 
it was an ongoing project. It was one that took the majority of the three months that I was there and that I still am continuing today to evaluate just because um, the scope of this project was so large and that we had 60 different mental health trusts as well as thousands of police officers that we re re required a survey as well as a systematic review that also blended some scoping review methodology and that took also a long time to complete and is still ongoing. And what I was really interested at with the street triage was the more logistical side of how the healthcare system was actually able to fund these projects. Because what I found is that unanimously, um, mental health trusts knew that they required a specific mental health crisis pathway, but they weren't sure on the exact logistics of how to best enact this. So how are we actually going to collaborate with the police? What alternatives would be available? What band the nurses um, would have to be? Um, for reference, within the NHS, they have a band system for hierarchy funding. So depending on what band you are, that's a standardized procedure for how much you get paid and also the training that you might be subjected. To. So these were all different questions that we had for street triage and that we were um, able to ask the different mental health trusts. And this data collection is still ongoing, but so far we have a really good response rate. And a lot of people do seem interested in making sure that street triage um, police collaboration is available at every mental health trust. So within my internship, I was so grateful and lucky to have amazing mentors who really went out of their way to make sure that I learned about the United Kingdom health system as well as the common health problems and disparities that they were noticing. So this was different researchers, people involved in policy, as well as clinicians that all served as amazing guides to me. And so something that they really stressed was that I should get the opportunity to shadow within the NHS and compare the provision of care between Canada and the UK. This is amazing. I, every week, um, would be able to shadow for one to two days, usually after my shift at the office. And I would do home visits and outpatient clinic visits and um, be able to observe patient interactions and then look at um, how the clinicians were able to combine their knowledge of the health system with what patients actually required. And I really enjoyed this because it made my research seem a lot more grounded. It made me feel more connected to the work that I was doing and understand um, really the different health disparities that were common in the area just because I was able to get that first-hand exposure. It was something that did require a lot of paperwork, if anyone is interested in it. We had to go through several contracts within the NHS um, just because they have all these really well-validated issues on patient confidentiality and making sure patients felt comfortable. But I really did enjoy shadowing. And what I would do is, when shadowing, um, the clinician would always stress that I was just shadowing to learn. So if a patient ever felt uncomfortable, I would leave just because um, I was mostly shadowing in a psychiatric setting, and we wanted the patients to feel as comfortable as possible. And then from there, after my shadowing, I would talk to um, the research supervisors and clinicians involved about what I had seen, ask them my questions, and try to connect that to my research, which I really enjoyed. Something else that I got to do, um, my supervisors noticed that I was really passionate on refugee and immigrant health. They encouraged me to reach out to local organizations. Just because Oxford is so well connected, you have all these different hubs of learning and research and knowledge translation. It was amazing. You could walk down the street and run into 20 different people and 20 different organizations that all wanted to mentor you and help you succeed. So I got involved with Evidence Aid and Cochrane Library as well. This is something that I would do in addition to my internship, so usually on weekends or after 5 p.m. And what I was interested in was enabling the clinicians, policymakers, and health system leaders that I saw on how to actually use the evidence that we were collecting. So um, Evidence Aid and Cochrane were great in giving me training on how to create practical tools like rapid reviews, systematic reviews, and they also gave gave me more insight on the healthcare system, uh, not only in the United Kingdom, but also Western Europe. And it was something that I really enjoyed doing just because I got to go to Cochrane London, which is their international headquarters, as well as Cochrane UK, which is located at Oxford, which is their national headquarters. So 
it was a great opportunity for me to just ask any questions, bridge the different things that I had been learning in my internship, and apply that to practical career goals, and talk to people specifically about um, their thoughts on the United Kingdom health system, and what I could do as someone from McMaster or someone from Toronto to learn more and contribute more. Something else that I did was take the advantage of different conferences and training opportunities. I attended Evidence Live in the United Kingdom, which was held by the BMJ and the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine. That was an amazing conference. I got to meet the editor-in-chief of the BMJ and talk to her a little bit. I got to learn more about what people were practically doing at Oxford and all over. There are people from um, from Canada, such as um, people from McMaster, who I got to speak to as well, and they were so um, happy and excited to learn that I was also Canadian, which was really nice. Um, something else that I got to do was um, travel to South Africa after my internship had finished and present a oral presentation at the Global Evidence Summit. I talked a little bit about the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program as well as about some of the work that I had been doing in my internship and with Evidence Aid. That was a great opportunity as well. I met another QE scholar there, Matthew Yao, and we were able to discuss our internship and discuss the different opportunities that were available. Other um, conferences that I had attended included talks that were held regularly at Oxford on the healthcare system. I also attended a training workshop. It was like a six-hour workshop on systematic reviews and how to use them in a humanitarian health context. There were just so many amazing opportunities that were available because I was at the center of all of this learning, and a lot of them were free for students. A lot of them weren't, but a lot of them were free, and I was able to attend. So that was something that I really took advantage of when I was at Oxford. And so overall in my experience, I really enjoyed my time in the United Kingdom. And what I would say really helped was that I was able to connect so much with other QB scholars. Um, when I landed in the UK, I was able to meet two other scholars, uh, Young Lee and Matthew Yao, who were doing an internship in London. So I was in Oxford, which is around two hours away from London, but I was still able to go to London on weekends and meet with them. I also met, uh, met Anson Chung when he came later on in the year. And then what we would often do is set up excursions and explore different parts of the United Kingdom together. It was a great opportunity to sort of learn what they were doing, just because, for example, one of the scholars was also working within the NHS, but he was working at it from a London perspective, and I was working at it from a more Oxford perspective. And that was a great way of making you felt like you had a support system, you could lean on each other for transportation advice, uh, to figure out how to do excursions together. That was really great. Something else that I did throughout my internship was regularly Skype with other QE scholars across the world, learn more about what they were doing, and it really made you feel supported and excited to continue doing your work. I'd highly recommend that anyone else doing an internship also look towards that. It's one of the highlights for sure, is just having that community with you. Something else that I found great was trying to find a community within the United Kingdom outside of QES. And this is a picture that I took on Canada Day in Trafalgar Square um, with literally thousands of other Canadians um, who were also celebrating Canada Day. And I was able to talk to many of them, discuss McMaster for a lot of them, which is really exciting. I also was able to go to um, different volunteering events. I took some classes that were locally available at Oxford, such as workshops at the Ashmolean Museum, as well as a beekeeping workshop in London, just ways to stay involved. I think something that people often underestimate in these circumstances is how homesick you can get if you aren't constantly interacting with individuals outside of the work that you're doing. I thought that Oxford would be more student-centered because it does have such a big university presence. But what I was surprised to see was that at this time of the year, so when I was there, I was there for the like most of the later part of summer, it's mostly tourists who are there. Um, a lot of your staff will go on work holiday. There aren't students around. They go home for the summer. It's mostly just different bands of tourists. So it was hard for me to find community in Oxford unless I actively sought it out. Something else that I thought was interesting 
I never really thought about the cultural changes that I would be experiencing when I went to the United Kingdom, just because I thought, you know, I know the language pretty well. Well, I, I, know, I, I like, know the language um, outside of the accent, and I figured that it would be very similar. But what I was surprised to see was how much I didn't know about the politics and the political climate of the UK. So when I was in the UK, I was there for several of the elections, and many of the protests that were constantly occurring in Oxford and London regarding Brexit, regarding um, the changes for the Conservative parties that were available, um, regarding different fundings, and even within the NHS there was a huge amount of unrest regarding how to best address these changes and challenges is something that I was very mindful of because there were so many protests that were available. I would see one almost every day on my commute. As well, because of the terrorism attacks that were happening in the UK, there was this constant culture of fear. And there was, I'll talk about it a bit later, but there was this constant um, confusion regarding how the NHS can best handle it, regarding the safety of its workers. And this was all something that I had completely no experience in when I was coming in from Toronto. And on the left-hand side, I also have a picture of a crumpet, which I was not able to get in Canada at all when I came back here. But I did find that, that the tea culture in the UK, we make jokes about it, but it was definitely something that I noticed. Um, every office that I went to would have a separate tea station, and it would be formalized breaks where you would go in and that you would be able to take time off to talk to your coworkers in a more casual setting. Something else that I liked for the culture at Oxford was that we had a golden hour, where it was two hours a day where no one was allowed to send each other emails unless they were absolutely urgent, just to catch up on work and avoid that constant stream of communication. And in general, Oxford had a huge culture of learning. There were always cool events that everyone would go to within the office and different open learning environments. So that was great to see and completely different from what I've been used to experiencing in Canada. Something else that I did a lot in the United Kingdom was explore, but I tried to explore whenever I could on a budget. So the United Kingdom is great in that a lot of the museums are completely free. So I went to the National History Museum, I think, three different times in London, just because it's free and it is something that is huge and has all these different parts of the world in it. I also went to the Welcome Collection in London, which had a private anatomy museum and library that was also free. That was something that I went to with different QE scholars as well. Even just walking down the streets of Oxford was so beautiful, and you were able to see the canals and see the different buildings, which was also free. I went to different street markets up until certain terrorist attacks, which was an amazing experience, one that I would highly recommend when it is safer. Something else that I thought was great was the amount of theater and the art scene. So I went to the Shakespeare Globe Theater several different times, and they would do modernized adaptations of different Shakespeare plays in sort of a reenactment of the Rose Wooden Theater. And it's only five pounds, so around like eight dollars a ticket, even though you're at one of the best theaters, I think, in the entire United Kingdom. Finally, an experience that I thought was a must-see was visiting the White Cliffs of Dover, which I did with Anson. Again, free, and something that I thought was pretty interesting is that most people from Oxford and London didn't really get why we were visiting Dover. Um, it was something that mostly tourists from out of town would do, but from there I just thought it was a beautiful sight. And this is a picture on the left-hand side of us spelling out QES with chalk, just because the White Cliffs are completely chalk-based, and then there was all sorts of chalk drawings all throughout the streets of Dover. And I would end this by sort of mentioning that safety was definitely something that we thought about a lot in the United Kingdom. It was something that sort of hit us more when we arrived, because according to Travel Advisory Canada, before we arrived, the threat of terrorism wasn't as high. Um, it was only when we were there during the summer that everything started to elevate. And it really did hit us because a lot of the places that were attacked with multiple deaths and injuries were places that were at the center of London. So London Bridge or certain street markets that me, uh, Young, and Anson had all visited on multiple occasions. And it was only really by chance that we were not there on those nights. So there were several steps that we took um, in, 
ensuring our safety. One is that we would constantly check in, not only with each other, but also with individuals online. And whenever there was an attack, we would always message someone at QES, just letting them know that we were safe. And that was a huge aspect of communication that we took very seriously. Something else that we did was that we avoided um, larger areas and tourist attractions, uh, particularly towards the end of our internship. Um, especially at night, we tried not to travel too far alone, and we tried to travel in groups as much as possible. But above all, it was more the culture of fear that was experienced a lot um, by different um, groups. And even on Canada Day at Trafalgar Square, there were all these different protests on whether or not the event should actually occur just because safety was a huge issue that everyone was thinking about. So I'd advise that any QB scholars who do attend any country to constantly check the travel advisories. I had it on Twitter as well so that I was able to constantly get updates regarding closures of lines and um, updates on what might be closed off or what might be deemed unsafe and also to check in with your community, not just available on the ground, but also online. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone listening in the room and everyone online. I want to say thank you to the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program and the McMaster Health Forum for genuinely the opportunity of a lifetime to go do what I love abroad. Thank you to the NHS for hosting me, specifically my amazing mentors who always made sure that I was taking every opportunity to learn. Thank you all. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Abby. That was a very uh, interesting, very thorough presentation, and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us all about your uh, adventures today. Uh, we will take questions. Uh, for those of you who are joining me here in the room, just put your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll get your questions. For those of you that are online, I'm going to ask that you please put into the chat box, and I will read about the questions later on. Uh, so, Abby, what I'll do is I'll ask the first question, and we'll see if uh, anybody else uh, has any as we go. So, the project, the main project that you're working on, the street triage, uh, looks like a very interesting uh, program. It, it sounds like uh, it had an impact locally uh, in the Oxford area. So my question is a very health system strengthening question. What's the next step for that program in terms of potentially scaling it up uh, and improving the system nationwide? Mm -hmm. So I think it's two different things. One is how we can improve it at Oxfordshire, and the other is how we can improve it um, for every mental health trust available. So from the actual um, Thames Valley pilot, what we saw is that we found that there was still an excessive use of physical force just because people weren't being trained on how to work specifically with the nurses. There was an issue, an overlap of roles that could be mediated by having specific training available on collaboration, not just on their roles individually. Something else that we found was that the hours and days of operations weren't being sufficient. Um, a lot of the calls were happening very late at night, and they weren't a 24-7 um, process. It was more for um, days of the week as well as for more early morning. That's something else that we wanted to address. One way that we were hoping to do that is having a 24-hour advice line, um, which had mental health professionals who were directly able to consult police. And that is available at Thames Valley, but not other mental health trusts. Something else that we saw was the use of marked versus unmarked police cars. So one thing that you wouldn't believe was a problem in the street triage pilot was parking. So in Oxford, it is terrible to park. The roads are so small, there are no parking spaces available. So when mental health professionals were using their private cars, they would often arrive on site but not be able to leave the car um, in anywhere just because there was no parking available, which is an issue that sounds a little ludicrous and one that they were able to circumvent by trying to introduce more marked and unmarked police cars that would have better options available. And so that's for um, Thames Valley specifically, but then for 
generally in the NHS, we just don't have a lot of street triage services that are available, or if they are available, they aren't transparent uh, with, with what they actually do provide. Something that we do see most is making sure that we have a true co-responder model, in that it's not the police taking lead or the health system taking lead, is that they work together to triage who should be taking lead in that specific circumstance. So in a lot of cases we saw um, throughout the UK, we'd have the police arriving first, and then only as a secondary responder, we'd have the mental health services requiring first, but then the police would often escalate the situation. We had the opposite occurring where a mental health would arrive first and then not be able to address the safety and the security of the actual crisis. So it's important to make sure that they are co-responding, and that really comes from better communication and collaboration at the level of the control room with the police. So there's so many different things that we really want to um, improve with street triage, but I think the first step was really just to make sure that we have a lot of um, evidence on what is actually being available after we had this lack of follow-up with the pilot projects. Great, thank you very much. So we have a question from somebody who's online and typed it in the chat box, so I'll read it for uh, everyone to hear. I have uh, one question following your evaluation of the mental health street triage strategy and the mental health crisis teams in Toronto. What are some of the key similarities and differences that you noted, and what can each of the jurisdictions, both Canada and the UK, learn from each other? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about the Toronto Police Service specifically. So that is a mobile crisis intervention team. It's a partnership between participating hospitals and the Toronto Police Service where we have a partnership of a mental health nurse and a specifically trained police officer to respond to 911 emergency and police dispatch calls. And then the team together assesses needs and connects the person in crisis. And it's a seven day a week service, not 24 hours, but it's based on times where the police receive the highest number of calls relating to mental health crisis. And the mobile crisis intervention team was one that we talked a lot about at Oxford just because of the similarities regarding staffing. It was a police officer who was uniformed and a mental health nurse, which is similar to street triage. What we also found was that they had um, calls to not only police dispatches, dispatches, but also to primary response units um, regarding emergency services, something that we wanted to improve within Oxfordshire. Um, Finally, there was something that we saw where we were comparing the, the Toronto crisis intervention team with the street triage team regarding how they were able to transport individuals in a mental health crisis. Um, so in Toronto, sometimes that requires handcuffing as well as fulfilling of police duties through using different police marked vehicles, whereas in Oxfordshire, it was more ambulance based, something that we noticed. Something else that's pretty interesting is that in Toronto, the police are generally armed, whereas in Oxfordshire, they were not armed. And so a lot of the literature that we looked at was looking at whether or not arming the police officers made a difference in terms of helping the individual and the mental health crisis feel safe. And that is something that is still ongoing for discussion because you have improved security, but then it's also more threatening. So these were all things that we looked at when we were comparing the different teams to one another. Um, in terms of the differences between the health systems and what they can learn from one another, I really thought it was interesting how much of a role the government has in the United Kingdom with street triage. They were the ones who were actively funding the pilot projects and following up, and they were the ones who were sort of making the these stakeholder meetings to ensure that we had full collaboration with the police. Um, in Ontario and in Toronto specifically, we had it similarly, but it wasn't as strong in that the program was operating in 12 divisions across Toronto, but only in participating select hospitals, and they were able to have their own autonomy in deciding whether or not they were going to participate in the service. Um, which has its benefits and drawbacks, but it's definitely a difference. Something else that we saw was a difference in the diversity of the um, participants who were experiencing mental health crisis. So in Toronto, we're really diverse. We have all different sorts of ethnicities being represented, something that was um, documented really well in the data. But in Oxfordshire, it's pretty homogenous in terms of ethnicity. We definitely did not have that degree of diversity when we noted um, who was actually being intervened with. And 
that also opens up the ground for discrimination and unfair use of mental health or police services. So that was something that we wanted to look at for Toronto and seeing what procedures they might have in place to prevent it, just because it is operating in a more diverse area. Hope that answers your question. Great, thank you very much. We have uh, another question from somebody online. So the question is based on your work with evidence aid and you have to identify quality evidence. Hmm, so this is a really loaded question because there are so many different ways to identify quality evidence. But the quickest way I would say is looking for already appraised evidence. So um, it's evidence that already has AMSTAR ratings, evidence that's on the Cochrane Library and has been vetted by key stakeholders in the field, and even things like the BMJ, they offer um, different limitations that they do independently of the researchers, and they tend to appraise it directly on there, consulting things like such as health systems evidence, for example, where you have that pre-appraisal and you have things already compiled is also a great way of doing it. There are ways of looking specifically at one-off systematic reviews or even just original research and assessing quality evidence. But if you don't have a lot of experience with it and if you haven't been trained to do it, I suggest it's better to go to um, corporations and organizations that are already appraising evidence for you. Great, thank you. So we have a question from somebody in the room. So you know, uh, Normally what I would do is just repeat it for everybody else, but he's uh, right beside me, so I will <laughs> ask the question. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, very good presentation, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are the kinds of mental health crises that uh, need a specialist and which kind of the crises that can be handled by a trained uh, police officer? Mm -hmm. So I, that's a really good question, and I don't think it depends on the specific mental health crisis, but on the person experiencing it and their level of severity. So when we evaluated what sort of calls were going to street triage, it would be people who are threatening suicide, people who are threatening homicide on others based on psychosis, people experiencing uh, hallucinations or psychosis, all sorts of different things. But what what determines whether or not you have someone intervene with mental health training is the severity of whether or not it requires an in-depth knowledge of mental health. For example, something that is a complex case that has many different aspects of mental health. For example, someone with hallucinations who is also threatening to commit suicide, who also has a strong mental health history. This is more complicated. There are more variables involved and it's something that perhaps someone who's untrained is unable to accommodate. Something else that you have is if someone has a fundamental mistrust of police services, perhaps they've been detained before, perhaps they're homeless and are not used to accessing social services, then there is more trust placed on the healthcare system side and you'd want a mental health care specialist intervening then as well. So just one quick follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. So you, you say that it, it depends on the severity of the problem. So who assesses how severe the problem is from the first call? Like from what I understand, it's uh, someone has a mental health crisis, a witness or someone uh, nearby called 911. So would you be able to like assess the severity from the first call or how does it work? That's a great question. So. I'll speak to Thames Valley specifically, so Oxford. What would happen is someone in the community calls 911, then the 911 police, um, sorry, the 911 dispatch operator would call the street triage team directly and say, we don't know the severity, all we know is a mental health individual in crisis. And then they would be able to assess either on the phone, so a mental health professional doing it on the phone, or they would send the mobile team that has a police officer and a mental health person. And generally what we see is that the police officer first makes sure that the area is secure enough for the clinician to come in, and then the clinician assesses. And depending on the severity, they either go to the emergency room or they might go to a police holding cell, but it would be more so the clinician who would be able to do that. However, in the past, when we didn't have street triage, it would just be a police officer who may or may not have had specialized training. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm looking at the rest of the people in the room to see if they have any questions. And uh, anybody else online who might have questions, feel free to type it in the chat box. I'll ask uh, another question while we're waiting. Um, so Abby, you're 
You're now at U of T, you're in the medical program, so how has this experience uh, in QES and at Oxford dealing with these mental, mental health uh, crises situations, how has it informed your future direction as a physician? Hmm, it definitely gave me a lot to think about, for sure. Um, before entering this internship, I wasn't experienced regarding the different mental health disparities and the collaboration between different aspects of government and different aspects of the healthcare system. I had more of a simplistic understanding on what someone could do specifically as an outpatient psychiatrist or specifically as a counselor. I never realized that there are so many complex issues, such as someone who might not have a permanent residence, who might also be a threat to the greater public, who might also not have received any mental health um, examination before. So all these people with so many different social determinants of health who make up a lot of the mental health care system, that's something that I was really exposed to at Oxford. I also thought that the interprofessional collaboration between police officers and counselors and the 911 dispatch people, that really showed me the value of the team regarding um, health care as a whole. So it's something that I definitely want to keep looking at. When I came to Toronto, I did look up the mobile crisis intervention team and look up how they were exactly partnering between different hospitals and clinicians and the police services. And I also looked into what was available in Hamilton and Saga and surrounding areas. So it's something that I'm just more aware of now, I think. I would have had no idea about these partnerships. Um, in mental health before entering this internship and taking the actual opportunity to investigate them. Great, thank you. So we have a, another question from somebody else in the room. Um, and the question is basically in a city or an area where these types of programs currently do not exist, what do you think is the most logical place to start in terms of starting one? So is it buy-in from specific groups? Is it a government uh, initiative? What, what do you think is the best way to get it going? Hmm. I think ideally it would be from the government funding pilot projects. So what they did before is that they did it based mostly on interest. So if, indiv if individuals who are operating at Trust wanted to be in charge of launching a program and getting funding, they were able to get it. But I think it should be more on needs-based assessment. So there are areas that have higher rates of mental health crisis, more complex needs, and no other social services that are available. In some mental health trust areas, there are community organizations that play a role in crisis intervention. There are different training programs that are available. But there are some that really are working from the ground up. And so doing that on a needs assessment and giving the funding based on that. I think the NHS did a really good job on making pilot projects, so testing it out for 10 months to 16 month periods, and then seeing whether or not the, the, like the specific NHS trust saw a good enough um, change that they wanted to give in their own funding. So you have that first government set step and getting the money rolling and then from there putting it on the NHS trust. I thought it was a really good way to go. I think it just has to be expanded and for priority areas as well. Great. Thank you very much. So I, I, uh, I'm getting the head shakes from people in the room. Uh, I don't see anybody typing online. So I'm going to assume that we have come to the end. So thank you very much, Abby, for taking the time to present uh, a summary of the work and the experiences that you had while you were in the UK. Uh, I always tell our scholars before they go abroad to take advantage of uh, going abroad and, and trying different things. Abby is uh, basically the, the, the queen of, uh, of doing different things. We were actually talking in the room about when did you have time to sleep. Um, but not only did you do your main project with Oxford, you, you moonlit with another project, and then you had time to be a tourist and enjoy different things. So. Uh, that's exactly what we're looking for with our scholars, so thank you for uh, taking the opportunity uh, to its fullest, Abby. Um, uh, at this point, I'll just point out a couple of links on the screen. The first one is uh, a link to our Pool of the Scholarship page here at the forum. It gives you all the information that you need to know about uh, our scholarship program. The second, second link is a link to the, our webinar, so currently in a series of webinars for the fall term for students who primarily went away in the summer. Abby mentioned during her presentation uh, Matthew, Anson, and Young, all of whom are 
are doing webinars for us. Uh, Matthew, if you're watching this uh, live, has already done his webinar, and you can find his webinar on YouTube. Uh, Anson and Young have yet to do theirs. If you're seeing this later on, they will also be on YouTube uh, as well. And then the third link is our Queen Elizabeth Scholars blog page. So all of our scholars will also be writing a blog to talk about their experiences, uh, and they will be up shortly after their uh, webinars are completed. So information there for you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Those who joined me here in the room, those who joined us online, and Abby, again, thank you very much for joining us from Toronto. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.